Good evening. I am Mabel Wilson, the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies. And welcome to our program for this spring semester, shaped by the contours of the current pandemic. For tonight's virtual program, I want to send a special note of gratitude to our co-sponsor, the Office of the Faculty of Professional Development, Diversity and Inclusion at Columbia's Bagelos College of Physicians and Surgeons. And as always, a special thanks to Sean Mendoza and Sharon Harris, who work tirelessly behind the scene to get our programming out to you. Indeed. And I'm Samuel Roberts. Good evening to all of you and welcome to a special live episode of Black Lives in the Era of COVID-19. The podcast series Mabel and I launched last year under the auspices of the Columbia University Institute for Research in African American Studies and, its brand, and Columbia's brand new department in African American and African Diaspora Studies. Mabel and I, of course, are the series co-hosts and over the course of the spring and the summer of 2020, we interviewed frontline workers, activists, public health professionals, health researchers, and public intellectuals about the various aspects of the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on Black America. To access previous episodes of the series, please use your podcast ag aggregator app to find Black Lives in the Era of COVID-19. So by now, the general contours of the ethnic disparities in COVID morbidity and mortality are well known. Overall, it's true that according to the CDC figures from last month, African Americans are about 10% more likely to contract the virus than white Americans. However, this relative lack of disparity in the detection of cases probably has much to do with the persisting inequality in access to testing and diagnosis. On the other hand, African Americans have a COVID death rate nearly twice as high as white Americans. Latinx and Native Americans have respectively a death rate of 2.3 and 2.4 as high as white Americans. This is from the CDC's website. The distribution of disparity, of course, is, is not even, nor is it accidental or random. In South Carolina, for example, roughly 51% of all deaths in that state have been black people although African-Americans are only 30% of the population. In the early months of the pandemic in Chicago, African-Americans contributed to 70% of COVID-19 deaths, while only being 30% of the population. And the hardest hit areas are those where racial and ethnic segreg segregation was highest, like Native American reservations, for example. Although socially and economically complex, the reasons for COVID disparities are not difficult to understand. And most of them point up to the geographies of racial inequity and privilege. Condition of housing, for example, directly affects one's ability to maintain social isolation. Not surprisingly, the same districts and counties that contribute the greatest proportions of black COVID are also ones in which overcrowding, multi-generational cohabitation and housing instability may be found higher rates of under and unemployment and lower rates of health insurance coverage, both consistently found to be geographically concentrated, often in black communities, are also causally related to COVID morbidity. So too are the types of employment found in black communities. A year ago, the Economic Policy Institute found that roughly 20% of African Americans and 16% of, of, of Latinx Americans were able to work from home compared to 30% of white Americans. Additionally, in many cities, Black and Latinx Americans are more likely to work in those occupations such as healthcare, food services, and public transportation, in which serial exposures are a constant risk. Despite being labeled early on as quote unquote essential workers, they were often treated as virtually disposable in terms of the physical and economic protections afforded them. Furthermore, many of the health conditions that predispose an individual to COVID, including asthma, obesity, and chronic stress, are ones which can be found in Black communities because of the political economy of segregation, particularly exposure, exposure to environmental pollutants and access to affordable and healthy food. And of course, we cannot but greatly emphasize the effects of mass incarceration and the carceral state. 
systems which provide the literal embodiment of institutional and structural racism. In the United States, the general rate, general rate of infection is nine out of 100. But in this country's prisons, that figure is 34 in 100, one in every three people in prison. Is and this overall is nearly four times as high. The New York Times map of COVID infection in carceral settings shows that the worst hotspots are in areas including California, North Florida, Michigan, Wisconsin, East Texas, Arkansas, New York, and New Jersey with the largest Black and Latinx populations. Yet, the federal and state prison systems were and continue to be slow in the rollout of testing and vaccination. So here we are nearing, we hope, the end of the pandemic. Yet even amid this effort, of mass vaccination, we find disturbing disparities and inequities. On the surface, in many states, the Black percentage of people who have received a vaccination dose rarely equals, but occasionally approximates, the Black proportion of the state population. However, the, dis the disparity widens when you compare the proportion of vaccinations distributed to the por proportion of cases and deaths. In the Dist District of Columbia, for example, where African-Americans comprise 46% of the population, they have received 37% of the vaccinations. This 20% negative disparity is concerning, but worse is the disparity between deaths and vaccination. Black district residents have contributed 69% of all COVID deaths there, producing, in, 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 in terms of, or in regard to the vaccination rate, producing a 46% disparity indicating a greater need among them for vaccines. Similarly, high death to vaccine rate ratios may be found in Louisiana, where we have uh, African-Americans contributing 39% of all deaths, but only 28% of all vaccines. Maryland, where it's 35 to 23%. South Carolina, 33% to 18%. North Carolina, 28% to 17%. And Virginia, 24% to 14%. These disparities are evident right here in New York City as well, where the primary, primarily white Upper East Side neighborhood of Lenox Hill is roughly 50% fully vaccinated versus the predominantly Black and Latinx neighborhoods of Central Harlem and the South Bronx, where only 23% or so have been fully vaccinated. So to further discuss not only the question of pandemic vulnerability, but also vaccine inequity, it's a pleasure to introduce our panelists this evening. Wafa El Sadir is a university professor of epidemiology and medicine, and the Matilda Kim Amfar President of Global uh, Professor of Global Health at Columbia University, and the founder and director of ICAP at Columbia. She was also recently appointed as the director of Columbia World Projects. Her work through ICAP in more than 30 countries around the world integrates research, education, training, and program design, implementation, scale-up, and evaluation. It aims to address major health challenges through partnership, innovation, and collaboration. ICAP has a long-standing history of work in New York City with two community research sites in Harlem and the Bronx, areas we just mentioned. Dr. El Sadr received her medical degree from Cairo University in Egypt, a master's degree in public health epidemiology from the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, and a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. She was named a MacArthur Fellow in 2008 and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine named in 2009 and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences named in 2018. Welcome, Wafa. Thank you. Our next panelist is Greg Gonzalez, who is an expert in policy modeling on infectious disease and substance use, as well as the, the intersection of public policy and health equity. His research focuses on the use of quantitative models for improving the response to epidemic diseases. For more than 30 years, he worked on HIV AIDS and other global health issues with several organizations, including the AIDS Coalition to Un AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, also known as ACT UP, of course, the Treatment Action Group, Gay Men's Health Crisis, and the AIDS and Rights Alliance of Southern Africa. He was also a fellow at the Open Society Foundations and in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School from 2011 
to 2012. He is, he is a 2011 graduate of Yale College and received his PhD from Yale Graduate School of Arts and Sciences School of Public Health in 2017 and is a 2018 MacArthur Fellow. And it's a pleasure to be joined by Dr. Basola Ojikutu, who is an infectious disease specialist and health equity researcher who has dedicated her career to overcoming racial and ethnic disparities in HIV and now COVID-19. Dr. Ojikutu is an associate professor within the Division of Global Health at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's also a faculty member within the infectious disease divisions at Brigham and Women's Brigham and Women's and Massachusetts General Hospitals. Her research explores medical and research mistrust and barriers to accessing infectious disease prevention and care. Dr. Ochikutu is the editor of two comprehensive uh, textbooks detailing the HIV epidemic within Black and Latinx communities. One, HIV in U.S. communities of color. Uh, first uh, in, in 2009 and the second edition in 2020. In addition, she is a co-leader of a collaborative partnership with the RAND Corporation dedicated to developing strategies to increase COVID-19 vaccine confidence within the Black community in the U.S. Dr. Ojikudu also an extensive, has extensive international experience as a senior advisor at the John Snow Research and Training Institute. She has led the implementation of programs to increase access to HIV care and treatment in 15 countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. She's also the former director of the Office of International Programs at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Priscilla. Finally, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge the loss last month of Janine Irving, a brilliant master's student in African American and African Diaspora Studies, who also served last year as our podcast production assistant. And this podcast would not have been possible without Janine's input um, and incredible enthusiasm and organizational brilliance. She's so very dearly missed by all of us at ADS and IRAS and our condolences and support go out to her family. Thank you. And let's address pandemic vulnerability and vaccine inequity. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Mabel, I don't know about you, but I've really been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. You and I have talked about this. Um, I think I can speak for you, but I won't, you know. But uh, we've, we, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Wafa, Greg, and Basola for joining us as, as well. This uh, is, as we said, a continuation of a series of interviews that we did last year. And uh, it's in a lot of ways, it's our way of kind of getting wrapping our minds around what's been happening for the year or during this past year, and also um, bringing some understanding to the audiences that traditionally have followed IRIS and now the new AAADS department. Um, I think as good a place as any to start is um, Maybe we could ask you all briefly to walk us through and maybe just serially, starting perhaps with uh, Wafa and then Greg and then Basola, or in whichever order we might decide, to walk us through structural inequity and racism and how they've, these things have impacted the living and unfortunately the dying experiences of um, African Americans in the, co in the context of COVID-19. Um, and then also, uh, perhaps in tandem with that question, you could, we could also talk about what, all three of you have worked in HIV work, right? Which is, I think, more or less a coincidence we were putting this panel together, but it's a happy one because I hope, particularly as a, as a historian of public health, I would like to hear some sort of comparison that you all might make right? in terms of the research that you've done and what you've seen over this past year. So I guess it's a, I just already started this panel with a, with a long two-parter question, right? Which is help us think through structural inequity and structural racism. But then also, given that HIV showed us so much about those two things over the help past us think years. through structural inequity and structural racism, period. Okay, I don't know who that is, but yeah, all right. Uh, did I, I didn't, okay, all right. Um, 
I think she just yeah. needed to be. I think it's our closed captionist caption. Oh, okay. All right. So I, I think it just needed to be muted. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. So Wafa, would you mind uh, uh, starting us off? Please. Sure, I can start. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you all tonight and uh, today, and uh, and particularly to join with uh, uh, with you, Mabel and Sam, as well as with um, my colleagues uh, Greg and Bisola. Uh, wonderful to see you. And um, I was thinking that uh, along the same lines, and that uh, in many ways, some of our lives we might be from different. Uh, generations, the three of us, but I think we've, uh, we've probably had uh, similar experiences and also similar um, over uh, in the context of HIV and, um, and uh, lessons we can learn uh, from the HIV um, situation too, and how it's relevant to the COVID-19 situation now. Um, I mean, when I think back, I think whether we think of, um, you know, HIV or COVID-19, I think the inequities that were articulated by both of you, Sam, and by Mabel are really rooted in, in structures and um, systems and policies that um, have, have for generations put particular segments of our population uh, at risk, uh, both for these conditions, but also at risk for having poorer outcomes. And I tend to think of those two as uh, complementary, uh, being, being more vulnerable, being more at risk um, to um, health conditions like HIV or COVID-19. And then the other side of the coin is being uh, at risk for um, having poorer outcomes. So those are kind of a double, uh, almost a, a double impact uh, based on some of these structural uh, issues that have existed uh, for generations. And this gets at, and I think I've seen it uh, over the decades of my work in HIV and over the past more than a year now in COVID is that it's rooted in who has access to what um, and whether what that might be access to health or health care or health uh, overall, and who has access to economic uh, resources, who has access to, um, to um, uh, the kinds of supports that are needed uh, to navigate this uh, difficult uh, life situations, and, um, and how all the policies that are in place and, and the systems that are in place have uh, hindered um, uh, the ability of uh, segments of our population from, from actually being able to uh, to gain access to uh, the protective measures and to the to the uh, interventions that are needed to protect them as well as to also enable them to uh, to overcome uh, many of these um, of these difficulties. Um, I, I do think that uh, I always say that um, uh, there are lessons learned uh, from HIV pandemic. I mean, we're living in a moment in history. Uh, which is very unusual where we're experiencing at the same time two major global pandemics. We still have, of course, the HIV pandemic is, is ongoing, it's not gone away, and it's disproportionately affected, ag affecting again the African-American community in this country, particularly amongst men who have sex with men uh, in this country. Um, and, um, you know, and yet we have, um, I call them lessons learned, but maybe we should Sometimes I prefer to call them lessons not learned or lessons that should have been learned uh, from HIV that uh, could have really enabled us to have put in place over the past decades the, the policies and the systems in place to have enabled us to anticipate this pandemic, the new one, the COVID-19 pandemic, and most importantly, to be able to have put in the responses that would have um, uh, safeguarded the, the health and well-being of the population overall, and particularly uh, the African-American population that has been so disproportionately affected. Um, I can think of quickly of uh, a couple of lessons that are uh, rooted in HIV epidemic, and that's uh, there are people who are uh, vulnerable for a variety of different uh, uh, reasons, and and we have we we should have anticipated exactly those vulnerabilities and and mitigated them to protect people from this new pandemic. Uh, we also know one of the most critical lessons learned is the importance of engaging the communities. It's uh, it's very fundamental to being successful in protecting communities or engaging communities. And now we see it very evident in terms of the vaccine confidence issue that we're all trying to address. 
And then the other is, of course, what we've learned from HIV is that it, it's, it goes way beyond a, a medical condition with a, you know, and there is no magic bullet is that what's needed is a comprehensive response. Uh, the comprehensive response needs to address the, the social and the psychosocial and other needs of, of, uh, of different populations so that we can actually be successful in overcoming some of the difficulties that, uh, that we should have anticipated with um, the oncoming of COVID-19. So maybe I'll stop here and maybe hand it over to Bisola or Greg. Would you like me to go next or Greg? Uh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, sure, thank you. <laughs> we'll just talk, right? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, Wafa said a lot of what I would um, I would have articulated too. I think the way that I frame this um, is sort of when you think about HIV and COVID-19 and really um, most of the diseases <laughs> that we can think of both communicable and non-communicable, we're talking about a failure of root cause analysis, right? So root cause analysis, you're supposed to identify, then you're supposed to work on figuring out how to, how to fix it. And then you're supposed to learn from that so that when you move forward, you have sort of a new way of doing something. There's been a complete failure of that over time. And, you know, I, I sort of always ask myself, so why has there been this failure? Because there are lots of people, I think, you know, in our within our HIV community, within um, other groups, people who've, you you know, thought about many of the things that, that Wafa has mentioned and, you know, the sort of structural inequity, have thought about, you know, issues of access, issues of quality of care. It's not that people haven't thought about that. It's not that people haven't identified the root cause. It's just been a, a failure to fix it and then to learn from it. And I, I wonder, and I mean, it's, it's interesting to talk about when I talk about this with some of my friends, is it because, you know, th that really structural racism is rooted in this need for power? You know, like, is there is there something there where where we where we we don't want to fix it? You know, I mean, I have to stop and ask myself what exactly is going on here, such that we know the problems are there, and I'm not saying the problems aren't complicated, but it's like there are many aspects of it that we could be fixing, and yet as we move forward, we have not. And that's what worries me about COVID-19. This is not the last time we're gonna see something like COVID-19. This is nowhere near the last time. So at some point, you know we have to change, something has to change, something has to shift. And a lot of people, I remember back in March when we first started hearing the data that um, that Samuel and Sam and, and Mabel talked about at the beginning of the opening, you know, a lot of people said, well, this is a bellwether moment. You know, this is a time when we need to do something different. Well, where is that difference? You know, where where is that and what is it gonna look like? Because that's, that's what I'm not quite seeing. We're identifying, we're calling, you know, so, so we're calling out racism as the as the problem, but then where is the real plan? That plan that must be understood, and everybody must sort of have a, a sort of shared vision of, shared purpose for, to to change things. And I think that's where we need to be, and that that's going to take some some more momentum. I, I, some something has to has to change in how we're we're viewing these issues. Thank you, Greg. So. I want to build on what Wafa and Basola talked about. You know, this isn't our first time or the second time or our third time at the rodeo, basically. You know, the greatest biological crisis of the 19th century was a smallpox epidemic that almost wiped out a quarter of the four million newly freed slaves in the American South after the Civil War. But it was erased, right? Nobody talks about that smallpox epidemic and, and the devastation it caused across the United States a, a, a century um, a century defining uh, public health crisis. Um, and it's about who gets counted, who counts, right? Um, and you just have to fast forward from that smallpox epidemic that was literally swept under the carpet, erased from the historical record to the HIV epidemic. Who counts, who didn't count in the 1980s when you know Wafa and many of us were crying out for help? It was gay men, it was people of color, it was people who used drugs or sex workers. You know, Linda Villarosa is an amazing reporter, you know, wrote a piece in the New York Times Magazine a few years ago called America's Hidden Epidemic. I mean, what do you mean hidden? You know, every 10 years we discover the crisis of HIV among African-American MSM in the United States, right? So this question of like, what gets, what gets revealed, what's counted, what gets hidden, what matters is really important when we think about public health and infectious disease in America and we come to COVID. And we come to the disparities in vaccination or in, in, in deaths and, and um, infections, and we want to sweep it under the carpet. So we say we need an age-based rubric for, for um, delivering vaccines because it's a simple way to go, 
But what does it do? It obscures the disparities that Sam and you talked about in vaccination all across the country in every single state in the United States, right? Um, and so we are perpetuating a cycle that is really deeply rooted in American history. You know, I gave an example of, of right after the Civil War, but I'm sure we could go back further in, into the sort of American um, experiment and think about how, how infectious diseases have played out among African Americans uh, across the centuries. Um, and when Priscilla is asking, what happened, we know this. We know the effects of racism on health. Um, what are we going to do? And I think, you know, we're clinicians or we're public health experts or epidemiologists, um, but it's a political solution. These are political determinants of health that have, that have, um, uh, created the, the biological crisis in the 19th century that gave us the AIDS epidemic and are giving us the COVID ep epidemic, which all basically have disproportionate impacts among um, people of color. So we're going to have to figure out a political solution to this. And, you know, last summer, I um, got in a little bit of trouble with people because um, my friend Julia Marcus at Harvard Medical School and I were saying, like, the Black Lives Matters protests were a critical public health intervention. Just as important as sort of, you know, telling everybody to mask up and stay at home around COVID because the disproportionate deaths uh, um, among African-Americans didn't start with COVID-19. Um, we can talk about every chronic disease, we can talk about injuries and homicide and suicide, and we can, we can map that out. David Satcher just said there's about 80,000 excess deaths amongst African-Americans every year uh, compared to their white counterparts. So we're gonna have to think about the politics of public health, um, even as we sort of move away from the sort of our comfort zone of epidemiology and clinical care. Yeah, no, thank you, Greg, for that. And 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 I want to just maybe ask, and we can maybe come back around again to the HIV and read it into it, because I think there's a sense, you know, as we experience the pandemic, that crisis tends to produce a sense of ahistoricity. It's just happening now. We have to solve it now. We're in a panic. We don't have the, re you know, like there, there's a sense of this sort of like, um, you know, that there's no sense that, oh, you know, this is information or this this comes from somewhere. And we see, we saw very immediately around the pandemic within literal weeks, right, that there were these these inequities that 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 were emerging. But can you help the audience maybe understand a little bit more? And also, Sam, you can chime in with your own work as well, like these histories um, of the formation of these systemic inequalities. How do they form? Where do they form? Because I think that might help people also understand what is needed to be fixed, right? And how it isn't just a, a you know, a, a, a a problem of, of this moment, but one that has been, you know, historically in formation. Well, I'm going to resist the, the invitation to do double duty as panelist and contributor, but uh, I, maybe after we hear from our, our brilliant panelists, I certainly have some thoughts on that, but I would, uh, and I think maybe Greg, if you wanted to continue, build out on what you just said, you know, because you're mean, just saying like, we're, there's ways in which, you know, we hide things that were there in plain sight for a long time, right? Well, look, you know, so I talked at the Civil War and I could go through the sort of way in which um, racism has, con has basically formed our, our public health and our healthcare system in the United States. Remember, you know, African Americans were excluded from the New Deal programs. When President Truman tried to extend rural hospitals into the American South, he only could do so with um, the agreement that Southern governors could pick where those hospitals went. Um, the idea of extending healthcare to Americans has been called the Prussian menace, depending on which part of the 20th century you're in, or the red menace, right? Medicaid expansion uh, has been refused in a bunch of Southern states. And so this is all tied to sort of like a strange American exceptionalism about the idea that taking care of each other is something foreign um, or, 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 or um, something that doesn't make sense for sort of the American imagination. And it's left us with a fractured patchwork of a healthcare system that's left millions alone against the virus, against coronavirus. But they were already abandoned long ago, right? You know, if we talk about you know the the history of American healthcare, it's always been based on this sort of idea of white ambivalence at every turn, right? Um, you know, there were questions back again at the Civil War level that um, there's a theory of black extinction, right? That that no charitable black scheme can wash out the color of the Negro, or change his inferior nature, or save him from his inevitable fate, quote unquote, from a legislator at the time. Um, and then you have Alex Azar saying communities of color, uh, their disproportionate impact of COVID-19 was based on underlying conditions, which were their fault, but not the fault of any of us or the political system that, that set them up uh, for, for these health disparities that well preceded COVID-19. Yeah, when you uh, 
what you when you mentioned Linda's piece from I want to say it was 2018, but perhaps 19 um, about the hidden epidemic. There's ways in which that act of hiding occurs on several levels, right? I mean, there's the social visibility or invisibility, but then also on the level of disease surveillance, right? The kind of like uh, um, there's, I have a good colleague, a former student of mine, Maria John, who, who just gave a talk here at Columbia last month about data visibility and invisibility and, and data genocide in ways that, you know, when you're not visible to the data collectors or the, the more importantly, the methods by which you're collecting data, then you've already started that process of neglect, which, you know, falls along that genocidal continuum. And the prime example is that I think in most states, um, it was very slow if it's happened at all, where uh, HIV status is part of the, um, is recognized as being a, a priority for vaccination, right? I mean, when we have stage one, stage two, and stage three, it's only been recently, I think, that some of the states have added those there. And so that's just, you know, it kind of reminds me about, you know, in those early years of HIV, we didn't recognize HIV symptoms in women, right? That was, I mean, Greg, you remember this, this was ACT UP, I mean, um, who really brought that out there. So, uh, that was not a question, by the way. That was just my little comment to add to that as well. But thinking. Um, Thank you, Sam. Was, yeah, and just thinking about, uh, I said I was going to resist joining in, and then what did I do? I joined in, of course. <laughs> and Mabel knows I do that. Um, but also, I think uh, also that ahistoricity, uh, Wafa, this is something you've seen. You, uh, you know, bef before you were doing work with ICAP, and in all over the world, you, as far as I understand your career, you were, you cut your teeth at Harlem Hospital. Is that correct? Right? That's correct. Uh, yeah. So you saw this. I mean, have mm -hmm. we learned anything in? Okay, that's obviously a loaded question. What do you think we've learned since those days, the 1980s versus today, in terms of you know thinking about the history of these conditions? Well, I think again, uh, yes, it is true. I, I mean, I think uh, my probably my uh, my career at Harlem Hospital was so formative uh, for me, and uh, both both in a professor professional way, but also in a very personal way as well, uh, because it was in the at the height of the epidemic and uh, at a time when the devastation of the epidemic was so evident in the Harlem community and. Uh, and and for a lot of the same reasons that we're talking about here today, it was um, it was all about um, disenfranchised communities um, left out, forgotten, uh, hidden in some ways, hidden in full sight. Um, they were not hidden from me or others who were engaged in this work, but nonetheless, it was um, they were not at the forefront. They were not the uh, they were not the prioritized group. They were not the center of what we should be doing and must do. And um, and I think importantly is I think that the lessons that uh, that certainly I learned uh, from the experience is um, is in many ways also we we underestimate communities and and the resilience and um, the resilience that exists the strength that exists in some of the communities that people perceive as uh, disordered or dis disenfranchised is is just it, that was very profound to me in in really appreciating the resilience the the strength the the core values that were very deep uh, within the community where I worked and also the innovations and ideas that people had in terms of how to how to help themselves how to create the the programs that are responsive to their needs. What they need is really somebody who listens and, um, and engages and responds uh, to these needs and, and takes into account this, those, those community uh, resources and strength that exist. And, um, and unfortunately, that doesn't happen very often. I mean, that's a lesson we learned early on. So here we go with COVID and everybody's kind of surprised that, wait a minute, we have two vaccines available, uh, but um, what are we gonna do with those two, two vaccines? And then surprised again, when we see that confidence varies between communities and so on. Um, we never, I, I always, when I think back in the context of COVID, uh, COVID situation now with the vaccines in particular, is that last summer we had a 
a summer where we had very low cases, numbers of cases. Uh, we were really in a honeymoon period in the COVID era in New York City. And yet we knew these vaccines were coming um, down the line. We knew they were under development, uh, but we weren't working. We weren't taking those lessons learned and preparing. We were, and, he, and then there was surprise, surprise. We have two vaccines and now we need to move. And it's unfortunate is that is that between these crises, I think Mabel, you're getting at this, between these crises, uh, we get, we are lulled. You know, there's this moment, almost a, a silence that happens that, uh, and, and, and periods of time and sometimes decades or months or years where uh, we lose time uh, rather than taking the lessons learned and transforming the reality of people's lives in a way that advances their health and well-being, we are lulled into complacency and uh, people go back to business as usual rather than momentum building momentum and and and, and putting in the the resources that are needed uh, uh, and the engagements that are needed to be able to uh, maintain health and well-being and protect from the next threat that may be coming around the corner yeah i mean i maybe want to follow just follow up with that in in the observation that you know and this goes back to this question of being seen um and that you cited that there are community, you know, organizations and, and, and modes through which um, there's a more on the ground um, network. How might those be mobilized um, in order to maybe address some of these disparities? And I know, Greg, you, you've been doing work on the new politics of care. And I know, Basola, you're, you've got an interest in, you know, getting the word out around the vaccine. And, and how can, can those things be mobilized? Think to to transform some of these conditions. So I'll I'll chime in um, and sort of follow up on what Waffle was saying, and then obviously what what you're really uh, discussing, uh, Maple. Um, I think if you look about think about this whole issue of, of COVID vaccines and the fact that we have these very clear cut disparities in who's getting access and who who's not and who's you know. Um, choosing to take it and who's not, you know, what, what the numbers look like by state, you know, the solutions are, are actually quite simple and people have proposed, you know, sort of the, the solutions, you know, the solutions should be to prioritize, you know, vaccination, open sites in the hardest hit neighborhoods and then prioritize the people who are actually living in those neighborhoods using some sort of mechanism, some, some sort of metric, try to, you know, get people to um, have better access, streamline access so it's not online, all this sort of thing, and, and not to use a one size fits all approach. So everybody's written about this. This is, this is what everybody's saying. I think, again, it's like we know the problem and we even know, you know, kind of what we need to do. The problem here though, is that we need to go beyond that and we need to do what you're talking about, Mabel. You're, you're, you're very clearly stating that we need to um, make people visible. So I wouldn't, I, I guess I wouldn't frame it like that. I, I think that we need to shift power, okay? And that, that's, that's the way I always sort of frame, you know, the problem with structural racism. People know what they want. They know what their communities want. They know what their barriers are. They know what their facilitators are. They know where their resources, they know where their strengths are, and they know the solutions to their problems in their own communities. It's this sort of blinders that, that our political system has on about what these people who are supposedly marginalized can do or can't do and, and the resources that um, that they should they should uh, give to them. Because again, it's always somebody else who's distributing resources. And even if they're doing it in so-called an equitable fashion, they're the ones controlling those resources. Okay. They're they're just they're controlling where those resources go. That can't continue because that's that's not going to end up in a system that that's going to last over time. Okay. What, what will last is if people who are in these so-called marginalized communities, people of color most of the time, um, if they're designing their own systems, if they have the resources, if they have capacity, if all those communities where there's been chronic disinvestment um, over decades, centuries, <laughs> are, are reinvested in, you know? I mean, we've seen this in pretty much every city. And I, I'm gonna make a statement that may seem like heresy to some people, but it's like you have these mass vaccination sites that are opening in places and, 
you know, they may be opening in, in, in communities of color. They may be opening in, in communities where there's, you know, sort of higher COVID-19 incidents. Okay, fine. But the people who are actually getting vaccinated at those sites are not necessarily the people in those neighborhoods because maybe that's not how they want to be vaccinated. <laughs> you know, maybe that's not where they wanted to access this. Maybe access isn't just about sticking something somewhere from the outside, giving them some large grant to do that, but it's giving the, or it's, it's, it's putting the people who need to be the ones who are leading this in the position to lead it, you know, giving them the money, the resources so that they can move the situation forward. That's the problem here. And I, I think that's, that's kind of what Greg is saying in terms of a political solution is needed. People aren't hidden, nothing's hidden. I see it every day, <laughs> you know? There's Mass Cast. I don't know if you guys know, know Boston. It's, it's, it's um, Mass Avenue and Millennium Cast. People are homeless all along the street. People are literally using drugs right there next to your car. I mean, there's nothing hidden, <laughs> you know? It's right there. The problem is that the people who are in charge just don't wanna see it. And if they do wanna see it, they don't wanna necessarily give the power to the people who understand the problem because power is, is everything in, in our world. I mean, really, you know, it's, it's, it's about resource allocation. This is how our world moves. This is sort of the, the fulcrum you know, of everything. And I think that that's the bigger issue. And that's why, from my standpoint, from my perspective, that, that things exist as they do, you know, and it, it's, it's an unfortunate thing because I, I'm not really sure how to I think that's that's why this is hard. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to. People talk about dismantling structural racism. And that's the new lingo. You know, but what does that really mean? That's going to mean moving power around, and that's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. And that's I, I think the, the the root, the crux, the crux of the issue. And that's what people don't want to give up. Right. Yeah, I just want to respond to that. I think stitching what Wafa and Sola said together. Um, you know, Wava talked about the role of the community in the AIDS response. And, you know, it's a little bit of um, a cliche that, you know, we need to have the community involved. But when you start to talk about it in the way Basola's talked about it, about building power in communities to, to serve their health, own health needs, build their own health response, it becomes something different. And, and you know, the best part of the AIDS response was, was the, the building up of community resources across the globe to, to deal with a crisis. Um, and it's something that we we pioneered, but you know we weren't the first people to do it. There's the women's health movement, there's the Black Panthers clinics. Um, there's lots of sort of examples of, of community-led um, um, health mobilization, but it's about building power. And it's hard for doctors and clinicians and nurses and epidemiologists to surrender power and say that we're not providing you with a technical fix, but we're gonna help you organize and build power and build strength in your community. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to fund it, right? Um, you want to think about it, giving somebody a pill or a vaccine and making it all better. Um, but, you know, the, as Pizzola said, you know, setting up a vaccine clinic in, in a uh, poor community of color in New Haven, where I live, is not necessarily the, the fix for, this, for, for the problem. We've had generations of disinvestment in, in, in that community, and um, nobody's ever asked them how they would like to get vaccinated or, or, or talk to them about vaccination or preventive health you know, for, for decades. And so we, we disinvested, we underinvested in building the structures of community care um, while we're building these, you know, fancy teaching hospitals and at Columbia and at Harvard and at Yale. Um, we've disinvested in primary care to, 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 to the certain extent where like nobody wants to go into to the basic um, fundamental uh, uh, preventive and primary care that keeps people healthy and out of the hospitals in the first place. So we're talking about a really sort of top to bottom reorganization of how we think about healthcare, but really building it from sort of um, uh, the community up rather than sort of the teaching hospital down, which is another sort of heresy that um, nobody wants to hear about. You know, there's ways, and thank you all three of you for those. Um, there's uh, all three of your responses uh, evoke in various ways this contemporary discussion we're having about infrastructure, right? I think I've heard all three of you say to some effect or another, uh, or calling for a re-envisioning of, of how we think about infrastructure to include not just the, um, the biomedical models, which is Greg, you just said the large teaching hospitals and you named three major institutions, all, all three of which are represented on this panel. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I guess 
what I what the question I want to ask you is that to what degree do you see it that we've been uh, we meaning society socially we've been captivated by this idea of the great technological fix right that's how we get these major teaching hospitals at Columbia at Harvard at Yale right like these are kind of aggregations of large capital you know hugely capitalized medical institutions and yet we've left behind um in a lot of ways we might have discarded or left behind or forgotten a vision that's more like what you all are implying which is to say you know ways in which we take the already existing community fabric and integrate it into a new vision of infrastructure am i overreading that uh, is that where you all are going with this yeah i mean i think um i certainly agree with you i think the um the shiny new uh, hospital uh, new pavilions is is very seductive and uh, for some people but it certainly is um is not going to get us to where we want to get to uh, because it's often focused on curative uh, what we call curative health which is waiting for people to get sick and then trying to um, uh, take care of them rather than focusing on the health and well-being and preventive care as uh, as Greg mentioned and uh, and in order to achieve what those kinds of uh, the wellness of a community and uh, maintaining the health and well-being it's much harder work and it requires working across the whole lifespan, you know, from uh, enabling uh, women uh, to have healthy pregnancies and healthy babies to enable uh, all the preventive interventions that need to be uh, available to um, the population overall at any part of, of the lifespan. And that takes much, it's much harder to do that rather than sitting in one place and, and just waiting for people who are sick to come to you uh, to be taken care of often, again, with varying quality of that care. Uh, so I, I do think it's about a shift. There needs to be a, a com complete reconceptualization of how do we achieve health and well-being. And, and that, is a, a, that is a huge transformation for American health or American medicine. And it shifts the power from the curative side to more of what we call the community health or public health side. Uh, where we know that that's where we need to focus our attention if we're going to really achieve the health of all of our population and um, and 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 have the U.S. Uh, have health outcomes that are commensurate with other developed countries. We're doing very poorly across the board. So it, it is a huge reshaping of how we think about health and well-being and who's, you know, and putting... Um, the resources, as Bisola was saying, into the communities themselves and establishing the infrastructures there, the resources there to be able to get this done uh, is very fundamental. I sort of love the idea of having health hubs or some kind of community health hubs that exist within communities that are where you have people who are from the community committed to health and well being and who are able to collect the data and act on the data and have the resources to be able to do what's needed uh, to, to see the outcomes within their own community. And, and that's a very, very big transformation from now and the way we think about kind of where we're putting our health resources at this point in time. I also think sometimes it's, we need to be, go beyond health. I mean, the, in, the influence of education is very, very critical. Um, and the influence of economic opportunities, housing opportunities, all of these are very interconnected uh, in, in, with health and, and, uh, uh, that's some, and, and nutrition and, and so on, and access to healthy foods and, and the air we breathe, the quality of the air we breathe. There are so many angles to how we achieve health. Uh, that it becomes uh, rather difficult to just think narrowly of health. And what you need are the resources, all the resources coming together and this kind of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, comprehensive approach to thinking about uh, building, um, building structures that will focus on how to transform communities into healthy, thriving uh, communities. Yeah, there's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up too, because there's, there's this other elephant in the room, right? Which is the carceral state where, um, you know, I mean, as I think we all know, and I'm sure all of our audience members, uh, our, our audience attendees know, uh, the, uh, 
you know, a large proportion of people in prisons and jails are people of color. Um, a large proportion of them uh, are not wealthy. If you're wealthy, you, you get yourself a good lawyer and you don't ever go to jail or prison with some exceptions, of course. Um, and a large, uh, a overwhelmingly large proportion of them who are there are they're the whole, the, the whole matrix of them there from charge being charged to prosecution to conviction to sentencing deals with issues of economics whether these are crimes of ec economic crimes or you know whatever that leads you there so in a lot of ways you know prisons are are kind of resolve so to speak quote unquote these contradictions that we have in society right some of these inequalities that you were just speaking about WAP, in terms of you know specifically education that we have to think about if we're really to talk about health so are there ways in which, and then Dr. Ojikutu, you mentioned uh, people who are, you know, using substances quite out in the open in Cambridge or in Boston anyway. And these, you know, these are clearly kind of similar sides or different sides of the same coin in terms of our carceral state. So I wanna bring you in on this as well. Is there ways in which our vision of health in the future needs to address what we do about mass incarceration. I'm going to say that's a yes or no question, which is a terrible way to ask to to, to ask a question, yes or no. So if the answer is yes, then perhaps you can give some thoughts about, you know, what prisons do, well, what the carceral state does to health for us, and not just as, you know, as Wafa said, we shouldn't be thinking just about narrowly about health care, but also health itself. Is there anything that you all have seen in your practice or your research? that could lend us some insight as we move forward to a post-COVID world. Mabel, I think I stumped our guests or... Uh... No, no, look, I mean, you know, Wafa was saying we need to think beyond health. Um, and Elizabeth Bradley, who used to be a professor here at Yale School of Public Health, now runs Vassar College, wrote a book called The American Healthcare Paradox. And she said, hey, let's look at American healthcare spending compared to our OECD peers. And let's look at life expectancy. And guess what? We spend a huge amount of money and we get very little. We're down in the 20s or 30s in life expectancy. And like, I mean, shockingly so. Um, but she said the big difference in spending is not around health, it's around social welfare, right? And, you know, I'm a Reagan baby. I graduated high school in 1981. And, you know, Ronald Reagan said the nine most serious words in the English language are, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help. Okay, there was only seven, there's only seven words. But the point is, is that we've been told that we're on our own, right? And we're on our own in a, a situation where when we have problems, we lock it up, right? Um, the, if you don't have economic opportunity or, or um, other ways of making money and, and, and or, or, or if you self-medicate um, to, to deal with your issues, we lock you up, we put you in jail and we, we, we do this um, uh, more than any other country in the world. If we if we built up a new vision of healthcare that was broader than just health, but was really giving people what they need in terms of economic opportunities, educational opportunities, housing, um, all the things we're talking about, you, you, you might be able to, to, to really think of a new way of approaching health overall in the United States. You know, I'm very depressed tonight because West Virginia decided to, to, to sign a bill that made that essentially guts needle exchange and harm reduction in the state. The overdose crisis in the United States is exploded during the pandemic. Um, and yet our, our responses are uh, always in the wrong direction, right? It's not about social welfare and, and, and health, it's about punishment and stigmatization um, and criminalization. And so um, we, you know, we're at a, a, a fork in the road here. We can either, you know, repeat the errors of American history and, and get ready for our next pandemic as Mabel is, is, is sort of into this is not gonna be our, our first one, our last one, but um, or we can try to make a, 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 a creaking turn of the, the wheel and, and try to steer ourselves into like a new future that is really much more um, um, expansive about how we think about health and put us into the mainstream of other countries around the world too. Thank you. So, you know, I would just add to that because I, um, 
I think some of, some of this is, is frustrating. Going back to the previous question, but then also tying into this one, um, this idea of that Wafa mentioned of having like health hubs and thinking about um, healthcare in a comprehensive way and sort of looking at all the determinants of health, whether that be you know access to education, um, you know wealth building, the things that you know jobs, employment, the things that stop people from entering um, the carceral system. It it really, in my mind sort of boils down to, to profit, you know, and what is it that will make more money, generate more wealth for those people who are, you know, sort of um, in the position to, to, to get money from these sorts of things. Like when we start talking about these things like biomedical interventions and the, the push for these shiny new things, you know, who, who's making money off of the shiny new things? Shiny new things aren't, aren't really what's going to fix the problem long term, quite frankly. And, and um, you know, we talk about, you know, obviously COVID-19 vaccines, we all want to get out of the epidemic. And obviously this is, you know, um, groundbreaking and wonderful and that we, you know, have some wonderful, efficacious, safe vaccines. Um, but, but let's think big, bigger picture, you know, longer term, you know, we do this, we get everybody vaccinated, but then sort of, again, we're back to what's next and then who, who didn't get vaccinated and who didn't get vaccinated because they're not sort of part of the system and, the, and this idea of comprehensive holistic healthcare and we're, we're vaccinating people, they sit there for their 15, 30 minutes and they leave, but we're not necessarily linking them to any sort of other services. <laughs> you know, we have people coming in, they have, you know, a whole wealth of issues. They don't have primary care doctors, they have substance use problems, they have, you know, other things, they're, you know, domestic violence, all sorts of things happening, but we're, we're doing this and it's very it's a band-aid you know ultimately that's what this is okay it's a band-aid and we're not thinking broadly about and, and if you think about with hiv we've all sort of read all the papers and many of us have been involved in these programs where we think well how do we integrate and um i <laughs> think about a lot of the, the work that we've done creating like um, metrics to integrate um services so we have testing and we have counseling and we have this and that the other and we're you know looking at um communicable uh, non-communicable disease me um, uh, measures and this sort of thing but it's like we learn that we know that that is actually the way that things Things work better and have a more sustainability, have more sustainability, but yet that's not what we're doing. <laughs> you know, again, it goes back to what we're not doing. And that's what I'm rela relating all this sort of together is, well, why are we not doing it? You know, and, and I've, I've pushed, you know, you know, some of the folks, you know, in my own sort of backyard, we're thinking about looking at social determinants of health while we're vaccinating people and it's not quite happening. And, you know, I have to say, well, okay, well, well, why not? Is that just not where, you know, it's, it's not where the impetus is. It's like, we'll just deal with this and then we'll just get past it and kind of get back to status quo. We're tired of the status quo. Okay, the status quo is not has not worked. <laughs> so there has to be again some sort sort of new thinking. And it's not that I want to you know um, implode capitalism or something. You know, break down the pharmaceutical industry, the the enterprise or whatever it is. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we need to. And I've, I've talked about this with some of my some of my colleagues. Is like we need to somehow. I, I don't know if it's, it's democratize the process so that so that communities or people are more involved in some of these initiatives. And so there's there's more profit distribution so that people feel like they're part of the process and therefore solutions that are coming from the communities are, 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 are part of how we think about health overall. Because I have a sense that if pe there were pe more people who were thinking like this holistically at the table, as you're thinking through how to um, allocate vaccinations, they would have said, hey, <laughs> this is a great time <laughs> to do X, Y, and Z. But th that's about, again, it, it, I, I keep coming back to this, but it's about shifting power and who's who's yeah. there who's making the decisions and who's profiting from them yeah no thank you oh go ahead greg i think you wanted to respond no i mean these are needed structural reforms you know there's there's an article in the new yorker a couple of years ago maybe last year about the crisis in primary care and there's this thing called the relative value update committee that the ama runs right and it decides basically what government reimbursement rates should be for physicians and thoracic surgery head and neck surgery and urology have more votes than all of pediatrics, mm -hmm. right? So there's this, there's your entire financial incentive system for, for, for healthcare um, being controlled by a group of 30, 31 doctors, um, all tilted towards the, 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 the subspecialties and the specialties that are profitable. Um, and so I think like we have to do sort of a structural autopsy of our healthcare and social welfare system to see, you know, where are the, where are the profits being made? Um, where are the incentives designed to, to, to keep them in place? Um, because otherwise we're just going to be doing the same thing over and over again. 
Yeah, no, I, I was just going to point out in our, in our podcast, the first person we talked to, and this gets back to Wafa's um, observation about the built environment, which is the area that, that I focus on, was Malo Hudson, you know, who's a planner who works on these questions of health equity and the built environment. But it was interesting, across the board of the people that we spoke with within nine episodes, including it's a really great conversation with Tramel Thompson, who's a labor activist, but also um, a conductor in at the in, MTA on the subway. They understood the systemic problem. Like they know where the systemic problems are because they live them in their every day, which, which, you know, which I think is really important, which gets, you know, gets back to, I think, a more ground up. But I, but I do think Basola's point around, you know, we know there's this shiny new toy, you know, I was thinking Pfizer and Moderna, like that's going to solve our problem, not recognizing it's a much more systemic problem. And I know, Greg, you were involved in ACT UP, and it seems like not only do we need action, but how do we change the narrative? And I think that was something that ACT UP was really good at doing and making visible, as I think Black Lives Matter. I mean, look, I mean, for a lot of 2020, I was waiting for a political movement to start to address the issues of the COVID-19 epidemic. And then I realized in the middle of 2020 that it was the Black Lives Matters movement. Um, because, you know, defund the police is the first part of the phrase. The second one is invest in our communities, which is what we've been talking about for the past, you know, hour, right? And so, um, I, you know, maybe I'm a broken record, but I do think all of the, uh, many of the sort of structural features of our healthcare and public healthcare and social welfare systems are tied to, the sort of legacy of white supremacy in the United States and the way we built up and didn't build up public health and who got services and who didn't. And so I think, um, you know, we don't need an act up for COVID-19. We need to deal with the root. I mean, it's all of us talking about this right, right at the start. We need to deal with the root causes, right? We need to go to the heart of the root causes because um, otherwise we're dealing with epiphenomena phenomena and giving aspirin for the symptoms. Um, and, um, you know, uh, so that's where I'll leave it for now. Yeah, I, I think back though, Greg, I mean, uh, for the old days, as we say, uh, and I'm much older than you are, but um, of ACT UP and so on. And I, I do think uh, there was, um, it certainly is value to um, what certainly was a, some features, some uh, key characteristics of that movement, which were anger, number one. Um, and then number two was impatience, which I think is really important. And um, the call for change now uh, was very, very powerful. And I think also as well, very strategic, um, uh, you know, thinking in terms of where, where, the, where exactly the, the locus of attention should be, where the interventions needed to be. And I think uh, maybe you lived it so you can add to those as well. But I think those are kind of some of the attributes that when I think of how can we, um, how can we have this moment be a wake up call? I mean, I, I think what we want is for, I always, um, I'm an optimist by nature, but I, I and I do believe that, uh, I hope that COVID-19 is a wake up call uh, to, uh, to this country and uh, to all of us and uh, to, to, to find change and, and seek change and seek it with impatience and seek it deliberatively and strategically. I think it's a, uh, it's a moment in time where the inequities are so blatant that, um, and, and, the, and I think the, um, the assets are there to be able to mobilize around this moment and hopefully transform some of the fundamental issues that um, I think have been, uh, that Bisola and many of you have talked about. So I don't know, uh, Greg, when you think back of, of the, of ACT UP and, uh, you know, was it a, just a moment in time that, uh, I think it was a change, it changed the history of uh, public health. It changed the way we think of health. It changed, it changed the way in which, uh, um, you know, in, in, in which authority kind of, who has the authority, who makes decisions on people's lives. So that was a kind of fundamental shift. And I think what we're looking today is for, I believe is a, for a similar fundamental shift. Yeah, I mean, Wap, it's not an accident that a lot of people working on COVID right now are the old um, AIDS activists. But one of the interesting things is that, you know, Amy Kipchinski and I at the, at the law school been working on this idea of a new politics of care, and we're meeting new people, SEIU, the union, and yeah. who do they represent? Lots of care mm -hmm. workers, right? Um, I was on lots of calls with like NARAL and 
color change and a whole bunch of groups that you know are not COVID specific or health specific. And people are talking about how to stitch the narrative together. And so ACT UP was very single-minded and focused on, on drugs and the bodies, but there was always another strain to ACT UP, which was about the larger social features that gave us the pandemic in the first place. Um, and maybe this second iteration of acting up in America is about returning to the root causes that Basola was talking about and trying to sort of address them as a as sort of larger coalition to sort of move us ahead. Hmm. That's, we're almost full circle back to some of our earlier questions about the lessons of HIV. Uh, thank you for that. And, uh, and thank you also, Greg, for bringing up uh, ACT UP as well, uh, because I think in terms of our, the last 40 years of health activism, obviously ACT UP looms large there. And it's, you know, from focusing on getting drugs in the bodies, but then also you look at, you know, chapters like the Philadelphia chapter mm -hmm. uh, that recently been chronicled by uh, Dan Royals' excellent book um, and how they went quickly to structural analysis that with, and largely because of an influx of black uh, members into ACT UP in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, I think there, there's still a lot to learn here. I'm looking at our Q&A because uh, just, I just, it, I was just reminded that uh, we have an audience here who've been asking questions. I could do this all evening, just you know, monopolizing you all's time just by myself. But uh, we should do the fair thing and and look at what our um, what our audience members have been posing to us. There's a question here, and this goes. Um, I'm circling back to the question Mabel just asked uh, about change the narrative. And I want to bring in Dr. Ojukutu. Uh, and the piece that you wrote recently that who's, uh, I posted the link in the chat if anyone's interested, um, well, for those of you who certainly are interested, uh, your piece about COVID um, equity or vaccine equity rather, and then about narrative. And then, so there's a question here about vaccine hesitancy. And even before the vaccines were even, they were just a dream. Like it was a dream of a moon landing at this point, you know, like uh, before we had any indication of when a vaccine would be ready. There was all this discussion, you know, will black people take the vaccine? Mm -hmm. like it was just assumed automatically that there would be vaccine hesitancy. And it occurred to me as, a, as someone who studied, you know, such things, medical distrust, et cetera, uh, that we were crafting a narrative, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I don't know how conscient, how conscious it was, but certainly somebody was crafting a narrative before the facts were actually laid out on the ground. What prompted you, Basola, to put out this clarion call for vaccine equity? And as you said, shifting power, was it a response to the possible, I'm gonna just say it, allegations of vaccine hesitancy? Cause it kind of feels like an allegation, right? Like that black people aren't responsible. They just don't trust the vaccine. And then they will be the ones who keep us from opening up the bars and schools. Again. Well, so I, I, I definitely see your point. And um, I think the motivation was that I feel like we just, the motivation for, the, for that piece was basically because I feel like a lot of people are talking about equity, but without really thinking about the layers of complexity within equity, okay? It's not just about the distribution of resources because that is, you know, obviously problematic, but like I, I said before, that that we, we know, we know those people who, understand, who think they understand equity say that, well, you know, we need to do this disproportionately for those people who need it most. And that's how we sort of overcome inequity. But it's also about, as I said, sort of who's determining that distribution of resources, who is, who's leading the process, who's involved, who's, who's more than just at the table, but who's actually has, has the influence. And then I was, I was talking there also about demand creation. So then I, that gets to your, your question. So medical mistrust exists. We all know <laughs> medical mistrust exists. And, you know, a lot of the work that um, I've done basically looking at within HIV, thinking about HIV related mistrust and sort of these what one might call conspiracy theories, so I don't like necessarily to use that term, really look at this idea and what what is it about our communities? What is it about our history that leads us to um, potentially mistrust the system? Well, the, re the reality is that, that our systems have not really been trustworthy over time. And I think everybody recognizes that. But I think 
the way it's been framed sometimes is almost pathological. You know, I, I think what the way it needs to be reframed is that it's quite normal to mistrust. If you didn't mistrust our systems and you look like me, something may be wrong. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, if you didn't stop and think for a second, I'm not, I'm not saying mistrust necessarily just COVID-19 vaccines. If you didn't stop and think, what's going on here? Who's in charge of this? How is this being distributed? If you don't think about all those layers, I think that, that something, um, something is not quite you're not thinking through the whole system so that's and that's basically where i, I was where i was kind of talking about medical trust in regards to this issue of a vaccine hesitancy quote unquote i think people are moving away from that term first of all they're sort of thinking about vaccine confidence or demand creation because the reality is that most of the people in these larger surveys most of the black people in the larger surveys they may have said that initially they would not um want to take the, the COVID-19 vaccine. But what they were saying in a, in a deeper level, and I guess this is a problem with cross-sectional surveys, is that oftentimes you don't get to that deeper level. What they were saying in, in subsequent questions was that eventually they may be willing, give us time, give us time to assess the scenario. That's what I just said about medical mistrust. Let, let, let us see how this happens. Let's see how it's rolled out. Let's see how it plays out. Let's see if there are side effects as, you know, as, as people become vaccinated. Let me talk to my friends. Let me talk to my doctor if I have one. Let's see how this happens because I do have this. I understand that this, it's not just about the history. It's about what's happening now. I do know that there are problems in our system. I do know that racism exists. I know that my life may not be a high priority. <laughs> or not be as, as high a priority as other people's lives. And I'm just being very blatant in this, in my response and in, in, in how I sort of feel about this and how I think about it. And, and the reality is that um, I'm not sure, I think that that narrative that you're talking about sort of preceded everything that we understood about it. You know, I think, and I think, I, I think that narrative was unfortunate because it, it didn't, take into account these complexities that I'm explaining. You know, it didn't take into account that we know there's this history. We know that what's happening in our contemporary world is wrong. We know that people, Black people, other people of color, should, should stop and think about our systems and, and, and question and ask and advocate for themselves because we know the history of this country. We know the history of this world. So given that that's the case, we should expect them to wonder about a new intervention, a new innovation that they were not involved in from the very beginning. Because quite frankly, the trials went move forward. They didn't really have a lot of community engagement from the very beginning, which is another issue that, that we could that we could sort of talk about. So I, I do think that yes, that the narrative has um, is has been misunderstood. It's it's been you know sort of crafted in a way that I think is is detrimental, and I think that it, it's changing because there there have been some really good um, papers. Not I'm not really just talk, talking about what what I wrote. I'm really talking about the ones that have really been speaking about um, uh, vaccine hesitancy and how it's related to structural racism and how it's about the here and now and not not just the past. So. I do think things are changing. And, and as of the last data that I looked at, probably around 61% of black people are, are willing and in large sort of surveys willing to, to take the vaccine. And that's because it's taking them time. And, and as we move along, more people will, will want to take the vaccine as they sort of assess the situation. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great way of, of saying, I just want to add like mistrust instead of hesitancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, WAPA. Yeah, and I think again, the, this connection to HIV, I mean, this brings back um, really um, uh, painful memories. Um, uh, you know, in the early years of, um, uh, once we had the effective treatment for HIV uh, and, um, and my work at Harlem Hospital where we faced the same thing. I mean, this was exactly what happened then, um, which was um, uh, again, this, um, uh, very much articulate as um, I don't want to be the first one, you know, this, this, uh, the sense of I want to wait and see, you know, the wait and see, I want to, I want to wait and see because of, because of this history of, of mistrust, the history of, of course, the legacy of research and abuse of research and the health system and abuse by the health system. And this was something that was quite difficult to, um, for me as a provider, um, uh, to deal with at that time, because um, obviously when we had those treatments, they were essentially immediately life-saving. I mean, it was a moment in history when waiting and see was 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 um, was very painful to watch because, of course, you there wasn't much time to wait and see. So I think again, uh, this this idea of uh, of waiting to learn more, waiting to see how others do with the vaccine or with treatment. 
it was something that was also uh, very evident in the early years of the HIV epidemic. And then what happened is when people started seeing other people like them, you know, uh, on treatment and doing well, uh, the confidence was gained. And I think it was, and also when they started seeing that there were programs in the community and within the community that they could trust, I think that was also very important in getting to the point where we had much broader acceptance of, of treatment uh, amongst the people living with HIV from the African-American community. Right. Thank you all for, for sharing that story. And, and I do want to get maybe back to this question of mistrust and, and again, history. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, medical knowledge, a lot of produced on the through, through the examination, sometimes violent um, of, 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 of black bodies, enslaved bodies. Um, you know, I know I recently did work at the University of Virginia and, you know, the 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 medical school, the, the initial medical school, the bodies, the cadavers that they were working on were, you know, dug up from slave cemeteries. And it was sort of like the sense of still profiting from the black body, even the dead black body. And I think that really does construct historically a sense of, yeah, I, I don't trust this system, right? That is clearly a racialized capitalist system. And and there was a, a question that someone asked, an anonymous attendee, you know, what is the relationship to the capitalist healthcare industry? It seems to me that investing in healthcare infrastructure between crises is always too expensive. And then during crises, it's too late. How might we insist on more foundational changes to a profit-driven healthcare system? Or should we radically, I'm adding this, radically transform the system, which is what I'm getting a sense that, that, that you might all recommend. So, so look, my friend Amy Kaczynski and I wrote this piece in the Boston Review called The Line Against the Virus, Market Versus Lives and then the New Policies of Care. It's not just the sort of history of white supremacy we have to deal with, it's sort of um, the sort of late 20th century neoliberal austerity mindset, right? We don't need the state to take care of us. So we don't need national health care. We don't need social welfare. Um, and um, then health becomes a commodity, right? And, you know, the fancier, the better, right? So um, I'm going to tell a terrible story and it's going to get me in trouble. But, you know, the New Haven Hospital just sort of took its primary care efforts and threw them to the waterfront in New Haven, right? Gave them to the FHQCs. So the New Haven Hospital can invest in the, the, the expensive specialty care that, that makes them money. Um, and didn't even tell the primary care physicians that they were doing this the first first day. So like, it's pretty clear that you know our system is set up to to maximize profit and not invest in sort of the basic building blocks of community health and community care. Um, and this has been based on the fact that there's there's a, a properized state, right? You know, if we had public funding for healthcare, public health, and social welfare, we wouldn't be having these conversations. If you're going to privatize all these services, you do it to privatize and to maximize profit, right, and efficiency. And so, you know, primary care and treating somebody's diabetes is less useful now uh, than it would be to, to deal with, you know, complications of diabetes that could, could be much more heavily billed, you know, 10 years, 15 years down the line. You know, I might also add, and I'm less a policy analyst, um, let alone a kind of policy engineer than I am a historian as such. But it also occurs to me that, you know, some of that infrastructure is already in place that, you know, really good health care, or shall we say health maintenance is about how many times you touch any individual person, right? Like it, the more opportunities one has to be seen and checked in on, the better. And there's so many ways in which all of us circle through various institutions where some of that could be done. Right. I mean, we don't we don't necessarily need to have a, uh, a system in which we wait for a catastrophic illness before we go to an emergency room. And then, you know, then it's just everything's out of control. And it's too late that there's ways in which I think, as, as Dr. El Sadr was saying a while ago, that, you know, we could have a more dispersed system of, you know, community based poly clinics, for example. Um, you know, we could do, you know, like we, this is this is the whole movement behind the school nurse program. Right. Where we have school health, where you know, children are checked in on regularly. You see them five days a week. If something's wrong with them, like we will know. I mean, this is all, of course, before all our kids were at home um, because of a pandemic. So I think there's ways in which, you know, we, it seems that it's impossible or really um, challenging to do this, but I mean, so 
I'm, I, I think also like Wafa, I'm an optimistic, an optimist at heart. And like some of these structures I think are there if we're willing to, to uh, you know, to, I don't know, to retrofit them, so to speak. Uh, we are, Mabel, do you think we have time for another question? I know we're hitting our. We are, I'm just wondering if folks had closing remarks perhaps to share. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, I think um, just, um, you know, my experience with ICAP and working in many countries around the world, some of the poorest countries around the world is that, um, I mean, these uh, many have been able to make a dent and really uh, improve the health of their populations. And um, and the way they did it was, um, was not by building um, these um, uh, centers of excellence, these um, shining buildings, these, uh, the way they did it is uh, through a, a transformation of the health system, through really working with community health workers and peer educators and going into the community, meeting people where they're at, building the health literacy, uh, building the, uh, the buy-in, the confidence, uh, being willing to go out there rather than waiting for people to come to, to health services. And I, I think it can be done, but it does require, uh, you know, a movement of the resources and, and the priorities. And, and that's what I think Bisola and Greg were also talking about is it is not impossible. It can be done, but it's a fundamental shift. It really is a fundamental shift in how we conceptualize the, the, the setup of our public health and our health system overall. Uh, but it is doable, particularly in a wealthy country like the United States. We have the resources, we have the talents, we have the community assets. Um, and I believe strongly that working with these community assets that. Um, well, I think you're muted. Thank you. I think if there's a determination and a commitment to mobilize and, and, uh, and shift resources and, and priorities. So I would just add um, to what uh, Wafa just, just said, which I think was is really a great summary of, of what we've all been saying, um, that you know this idea of shiny new things, shiny new buildings, shiny new interventions that don't seem to necessarily diffuse into communities of color oftentimes that I think Greg initially um, mentioned that. Obviously they're needed, you know, we, we, we're not going to, um, end this epidemic. We're not going to end, you know, HIV unless we, you know, increase access to pre-exposure prophylaxis and increase, make sure people are on antiretroviral therapy. These are, these are all, they're wonderful. You know, I mean, it's all, it's necessary. I'm, I'm very much so a supporter. I, I would never say anything like that, but I think it's conceptualizing them within, as a part of the whole, not the whole, you know, we can't be so hyper, hyper focused without realizing that, the emergency is the emergency, but the long term is what we really, that needs to be the goal, you know, actually providing equitable care, getting people to a better state of health, you know, so that they're thriving. That's the, that's the bigger picture, you know, and I think it really takes visionary leadership and, um, and, and really a fundamental policy shift um, and fundamental ways of, of, of shifting of, of the ways that we think about things to realize that these emergencies are, are one thing and we, we have to deal with them, but we have to be constantly thinking about what would make the, 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 the whole better. Where is, the, where is the sustainability plan? And this is what I have not seen in a lot of what our, our leadership, at least I'm really speaking sort of on a local level, you know, everybody's very much so focused, but we really have to think longer term, how do we integrate this more holistic approach, this more comprehensive way of incorporating people into our healthcare system into what we're doing now to really create structural change. Oh. I mean, I'm thinking about the Solis article, you know, shifting power, creating demand and requiring accountability. If you're, we're gonna end with any sort of discussion, I think um, we have to think about that. Um, and that um, if we're gonna see any long-term change, you know, we will get out of COVID somehow, but like really dealing with the, the present and, and our future is gonna really being about divesting power and investing power into, into communities, but also um, giving them the ability to, to ask for what they need. Um, and then, you know, keeping people in power accountable for the decisions they make that make us sick or make us well. And so, um, uh, you know, WAPA is like, 
harkening back to the, the era of ACT UP, and that's the lesson, right? Nobody gave a damn about us, right? Um, and you know, we we made them listen. And yes, many of us had lots of resources, and we were we were widely advantaged in a way that that made it possible. Um, but you know, we have to think it's possible now because we can't. You know, this pandemic is is you know it, it is bad, but could get a whole lot worse. And so we can't go through this again and and come out on the other side in the same place we were in 2019. So. Thank you, all three of you, Wafel Sadar, Visolo Jakutu, and Greg Gonzalez for joining us this evening. Uh, this has been a lot to think about. And I've thoroughly en enjoyed it. Uh, it lived up to everything that I expected and had been anticipating for the past several weeks. Yeah, no, I just also want to say thank you to our panelists as well. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Sam? Uh, I would say, th again, thank you. Thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, Mabel, thank you. It has been a pleasure to work with you on, this is now our 10th episode of Black Lives in the Era of COVID-19. Um, with any luck, we will all uh, be fully vaccinated and herd immune, as they say, and there'll be no more need for any more podcasts in this series, but hopefully you and I will work together on another project sometime soon so thank you so much it's it's been a real pleasure doing this with you and just one last update thank you all for attending tonight's special program and i want to invite you to our thesis presentations of our undergraduate and graduate majors at african-american and african diaspora studies here at columbia this will take place tomorrow april 16th at 4 p.m eastern standard time information about this and other pro programming can be found on our website which is fm studies dot columbia dot edu all right thank you all and take care thank you good night everyone good be night. well everybody thank you.